Today I'm joined by Dr. Tor Wager. He is a professor of neuroscience at Dartmouth University, where he runs the Cognitive and Effective Neuroscience Lab, and he studies the neuroscience of emotion, pain, belief, and mind-body interaction. Tor, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thanks, Adam. It's nice to speak with you. It's nice to have you here. So yeah, could we could you summarize your research interests? I'm not sure if I if I did it right, and then we can we can talk about uh, the specifics later and how you got into this. Yeah. Um, so we're working on really lots of different things that are related to affect and motivation and pain, uh, but there are some common themes. Uh, one of the themes that um, I've really been fascinated with throughout my career is about belief, and what it. You know, we started working years ago on ideas about you know what are the consequences of belief, uh, especially around a medical treatment. So if you get a, a sham treatment and you have a placebo effect, then how does that work and what's affected in your brain? And that uh, kind of um, manipulation of people's beliefs, and that's what it is, that led to other work on other kinds of treatments surrounding that. So if you have uh, talk therapy, for example, or behavioral therapy, that primarily works by changing your beliefs. And how does that then propagate to making your life better or helping you overcome uh, mental illness or challenge or chronic pain? Um, we've also branched out from there to think more about uh, pain and other kinds of affective processes which are like emotions, but you can think of affect as the basic things that uh, confer meaning uh, for us that are good or bad for us and that drive our behavior fundamentally. Uh, and so we started developing biomarkers for affect in the brain. You know, how do we track levels of compassion or empathy or pain, you know, pain for other people or self-pain when you're feeling pain in different ways and, and circumstances. And then how do we use that information to understand interventions and other treatments better? Yeah, so let's, let's hit the ground running with more of a philosophical question. I've wondered if there's any such thing as like a neutral stimulus or if everything that we perceive is like either pleasant or unpleasant in some way. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does make sense. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, so yeah, there are nominally neutral stimuli, but uh, some people think that we, everything is colored with value. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, I believe in that to some degree. I think there are more or less neutral stimuli, yeah. but uh, you know, some of the famous work in the past by, for example, Bob Zions found that just becoming more familiar with something makes you like it better. Mm -hmm. And so that's an example of, sort of very low level affective value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the idea is that if something appears neutral, is it truly neutral or is it just like our bias one way or the other is, is too small to detect? Yeah, right, you know, um, and people capitalize on these things. You know, some uh, kanji characters are more aesthetically appealing to people than others. You know, cars often have, they look like faces and some people actually sometimes capitalize on that, right? They can. The car, the car, you can see a car with a smiley face or a frowny face. And some people think that that influences uh, how, we, how we respond to them in very subtle ways. So I think there's a debate. You know, I think on one side, you can say that a lot of those things don't matter much. It's the things that, that really drive our emotions strongly that matter the most. But on the other hand, you might also think that we're influenced unconsciously all the time by very subtle cues that are like and dislike good and bad cues that shape our preferences in ways that we're not aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can you can tell um, some of my interest in cognitive science sort of stem from these more philosophical interests, but let's talk about your background. How did you first become interested in, in neuroscience or, or in psychology and pursuing these questions? Um, well, um, let's go way back to the beginning. Uh, I took classes in elementary school where we got to uh, hold a cat brain and wow. learned about uh, people with neurological damage. So I remember a guy who had a bombshell, maybe it was from World War II, lodged next to his hypothalamus. 
And the story was that he turned his head one way, he laughed, and the other way, he cried. And I thought, this is, there's something so profound that, uh, you know, things that we identify with our, our free will, with our volition, with our identity, you know, um, our, our attitudes, our preferences, our emotions, uh, our core beliefs, that those things can really be shaped or determined by the brain. Mm -hmm. And I've, I always thought that was really kind of one of the most exciting frontiers. So I hang, I hung on to that idea. I didn't pursue it. You know, in high school, I studied philosophy and physics, and then I became a physics major for a while in college. And then I shifted to music and I was a music composition major. And then I graduated uh, realizing that I really loved scholarship and thinking about people and people's minds and integrating information about those things, um, but not knowing how that was going to translate into my uh, career. And through a, a series of fortunate events, uh, I'll leave it at that for now, unless you want to hear more of that story, but um, I, I sort of really found my way into um, back into studying neuroscience, uh, just bit by bit. You know, I thought I was going to have to go back and um, and study, you know, chemistry for two years and physics for two years and so forth, all the pre-med requirements or something. And that might have been a great idea, but, you know, it didn't, I really got, got um, connected up with cognitive neuroscience and cognitive psychology uh, early on and in, in taking graduate classes in that um, and just sort of re-specializing. I worked really hard to, you know, for a long time to understand those things. And then it just kind of launched off. Yeah, you know, I do think that would be worth fleshing out because because yeah. getting a PhD and becoming a neuroscientist, it doesn't seem like a career you can really just stumble into. <laughs> I, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, so so I was I was um, I was traveling around the, the world, and I thought that I'd been doing yoga as well. So I thought maybe I'd go become a yogi. So I went to India, and I was gonna you know check out an ashram and see what that was all about. Um, maybe go to Himalayan Pradesh and go to the mountains and study yoga. Um, and along the way, before I really got too far, I didn't really get anywhere near an ashram, honestly. It just, when I got there, I realized it really wasn't my, my scene, right? It's not, yeah, for various reasons. But, but I really, you know, started reading on my own. I started reading about consciousness and I would look up scientific articles in the library in India, you know, the public library with the green screen with the little, you know, letters. And I, so I, but I was starting to read this stuff and had very, very naive, you know, ideas about it, but it was just really fascinating. Um, and so I ended up kind of pivoting and wanting to come back. And I think one of the things that happened to me uh, was, you know, having the space and time to think about it. So I was hiking through Nepal with this group of people I'd met and I got really sick. And so I had a, a whole day where they left me behind. I had no distraction. And I just sat at this little wooden table outside of this, you know, little hostel place for the whole day. And, and I was really just feverish, but also thinking about what do I want to do with my, my life? And I, I kind of realized, I think, okay, I'm good at scholarship, like that's a relative strength. I'm, I'm, I like reading, I like integrating, I like writing and putting the pieces together of a story, but that could be anything. And if I don't, if I don't commit to something and close some doors, then, you know, I'll go nowhere. I'll just drift, you know, I'll drift through. It's, just, it's not going to happen for me. So, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, gosh, if I could study anything, you know, given that I want to be a scholar, what would that be? And I thought the coolest thing is the brain. That's it. And so from there, I just said, okay, I'll just do whatever it takes, you know? Uh, so I, I went back to the States and I had no, um, no experience. I went to a college that uh, only offered one psychology course, which I didn't take, it was educational psych. Uh, and so I just had no background whatsoever. Um, but I started looking at books for graduate school and they all say, you know, research experience and statistics. And so I went back to University of Colorado. Uh, I re-enrolled as an undergraduate. I started taking online courses there and summer courses. And my first courses were, you know, I rolled in statistics because that's what the book said <laughs> that I needed, you know? And then the first day of, in the statistics class, the teaching assistant, his name was Dave Rettinger. He's still a professor now. 
and he he said, you know, my lab is looking for uh, research assistants, and I thought, check, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, anyway, so it's you know that I just and I just thought, like I said, it was going to take a long time, but I but from there things really kind of started to to just open up. I got the opportunity to take um, some wonderful graduate courses with fabulous professors there, mm -hmm. and and got to know them and they they just kind of steered me towards you know more and more kind of it, uh, an understanding of what cognitive psychology was all about and uh -huh. so instead of you know four years later i basically dropped out of cu after a year and a half uh because i got into to graduate school um earlier than expected and from mm -hmm. there i've always been sort of like pushed forward you know um yeah, that, that's great what year was that that you started grad school oh yeah that must have been 98. okay that's so that was that was when fMRI was like fairly new, right? Yeah, that was when when fMRI was was really pretty brand new. Um, and I had I had met my advisor, his name was Ed Smith, at CU at a he gave a talk and he talked about pet imaging that they were doing. And I thought that's it, like I want to study with him and do this stuff. And I can remember coming up to him after the talk and saying, "Hi, I'm you know Tor Wager. I applied to your." You know, graduate program he's like huh okay well we'll see if you make it past the first round and then you know if you do we'll talk <laughs> you know but he did ended up he ended up being my my advisor so i sought that out and i was part of the first generation i would say of people who whose primary graduate training was using fmri mm -hmm. uh, so so really cool. that from from you know soup to nuts or just kind of from the ground up so what did you start researching during that time during grad school in grad school yeah, I I um I started with research on attention and training and cognitive control, and that's um, in part because these ideas that I I had were sort of um, still you know forming, but they were it, I had this idea that I wanted to study consciousness, like many people. Mm -hmm. And that kind of became operationalized into, okay, what's a field that I can actually study? And that's attention. So how do you control your attention? How do you make decisions about what to, what to attend to and what to ignore, uh, what tasks to do and not do? And how do you control, essentially, your attention and memory in, in the service of performing those tasks? So it was sort of a, a way of doing research in an established topic, but that kind of satisfied this philosophical curiosity about, uh, about free will. <laughs> Was it influenced by your um, by your meditation stuff at all? Like focusing on attention and mastering the mind? Oh yeah, I think so. I, I didn't. Yeah, right. I, because I think um, yeah, I guess I've always um, believed strongly that we can improve our minds. We can we can learn, you know, to focus, um, and we can learn to sort of transcend our previous lim mental limitations. Uh, and I did, yeah, I did. So I did have this, I had the yoga practice and I had a meditation practice. Uh, and I felt like it was really, um, yeah, it was clarifying for me. I mean, it was helpful. And I, I had a lot of self-efficacy. And I also had, like what many people have is a sort of intermittent, very strong attentional focus or people call it flow. You know, so if I can get into even writing sometimes was like, that was great. You know, and you just, lose awareness of other things and you get absorbed in it and you go right and i thought yeah that's that's being able to hook into that um is a great thing and it'd be really fun to study you know how does that happen and why can some people do it well and how do you how do you get to the point where you can do it better what did you find out about that <laughs> i don't know if i learned that much about it uh, I mean, <laughs> honestly, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, um, uh, I, I actually think, I think for me, I mean, my, my interests sort of evolved from that, although those are great questions. I love those mm -hmm. questions, you know, um, I would say a lot of my, my, what I learned there was really experiential, you know, which is, which is that yes, you, you know, you you can improve the quality of attention um, if you. I, I still believe this today. If we give ourselves the space to for, for thoughts to emerge, we a lot of things come out essentially of the unconscious that we weren't aware of, mm -hmm. um, and we didn't know that we were thinking or feeling. 
And that gives us information. Sometimes that's therapeutic or it helps to bring those things to light. And you can sort of deal with those things then with the, the cognitive resources of your conscious mind, right? To understand, okay, where did that come from? How do I relate to that? And maybe in some cases, it's just liberating um, in the sense that, um, you know, people talk in meditation about, about letting the mind become quiet. You know, so if all those sort of intermittent interrupting voices and thoughts and so forth can, you can sort of resolve some of those issues and you're sort of centered or at peace. That's another way of saying it. And, you know, you, yeah, you can really focus, right? There aren't a lot of interruptions, internal interruptions or distractions. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I believe then scientifically from that, and I don't think, you know, I didn't sort of really discover this, um, but it comes from this major set of, findings on the default mode network and this idea that there are, um, broadly speaking, sort of opposing task networks. And, and I do think that um, that uh, the contents of, of what people call the default mode network, this system for self-reflection and mind wandering and spontaneous thought, um, the, the contents of that do interact uh, more strongly with these task-focused processes in the brain uh, than we had thought. So when I was in graduate school, we thought that being good at cognitive control was all about, um, you know, sort of doing those operations efficiently. It was all about the the, pre, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex or something. Um, but since then, you know, a lot of research points to the idea that uh, what these intermittent interruptions, which are presumably you know mediated more by these default mode regions, ventral medial prefrontal cortex. That, that those things that they're like life stressors, you know, those, those things uh, really interact with that, those, those uh, typical cognitive control lesions and maybe are even more important for shaping whether a person can focus or not focus uh, and yeah. Cognitive. Does that mean better cognitive control? It's not actually about the control. It's like about how much you're being interrupted by other brain processes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's, a, it's about, yeah, whether these um, stressors are, are resolved or whether they're interrupting you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny. So like I said, we've done different things, but there is a line of research that I've pursued in my lab, which, which kind of bears on that, where, you know, we ask people to um, give a speech, to prepare a speech to be given in front of an audience, and it's a stressor. And um, in one line of studies, you know, we found that this sort of unsurprisingly, I suppose, does uh, interrupt cognitive performance if you're doing a demanding cognitive task um, when when you have this you know evaluative load on you right um, you're being watched or evaluated and what it does is it increases activity in the the ventral medial prefrontal cortex which disrupts connectivity in these frontal parietal systems that seem to be important for maintaining attention you know so if I step back from you know, the, the, the nitty gritty of which interactions they are, it's, it's like, um, it's like your, your brain is really constantly prioritizing what, you know, what it, what it's focusing on and thinking about. And our conscious goals are part of that, but other stuff that we know is really important can break through. You know? Right. So, so like dancing around this whole topic is sort of the, the question of free will. It's like, how much are those, those priorities set by us and how much is it like, I don't, I don't really know what else would cause it, but maybe like genetic or environmental factors or just things that set your brain on something that isn't necessarily you consciously doing that. Yeah. I mean, so what's your position of free will, Adam? Do you believe in it? <laughs> I believe in it, but I, it's, it's also hard to make like a very um, scientific argument for it, I think. Yeah, there's a lot of lots been written about this, but it, but I think that the for me the scientifically defensible argument is that um, free will is an illusion. So you know, Den Wagner wrote this book. I think it was called The Illusion of Conscious Will. Um, so he's making this kind of argument, but that in our current you know conception of of physics in physical systems, the brain is a physical system, and the interactions are really, really complex. But what we experience as free will is a product of all of these interactions happening, or many interactions happening, right? Between memory systems and attention systems and goal formation systems, mm -hmm. but that there's no, there's no separate magic 
ingredient uh, outside the machine, right, or inside the machine that that um, produces something that's indeterminate. But you know, I think people have written about this too. May, that maybe it's a quantum indeterminacy, right? What tips your neural system towards one decision or the other? Maybe it's quantum, some some you know some sort of quantum indeterminacy, or some people do believe it's something that's outside our current understanding, you know. Yeah. Um, but another view is that it's just really really complex, uh, mm -hmm. too. And so, so even even if um, even if at the end of the day, if you could if you could somehow you have to measure the position of every you know quark in your brain with infinite precision then you could develop a forward model that could predict what decisions you're going to make all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but because it's a complex system, the interactions are so chaotic that if your measurements were incomplete in any way or imprecise in any way, then all your predictions would be wrong, right? So there's a complexity event horizon. Uh -huh. right? Yeah, that makes sense. So it's, it's too complex to ever track. But then, there, so there's still the idea that it's theor theoretically possible to predict anyone's decisions. But then that, that, kind of causes some trouble when you when you think of ideas like cognitive control or like overcoming your emotions or when you have enforced your willpower and decide to go to the gym or to not eat that donut and then it's like if, if you're if you're taking the deterministic stance it's like you didn't really do that your your brain chemistry was just lucky enough to to set you on that motion or unlucky enough to to make you pick the bad option right and so maybe at some level um, we don't, there is no such thing as free will, but it would be silly not to act as though we do. Because mm -hmm. phenomenologically, those, we do, we do make, make choices. We, you know, whatever that is, right? And those choices, you know, can have a big impact on our lives. Um, and so to, um, you know, to say, well, any choice that I just made um, is, you know, I take no responsibility for that because my brain made me do it you know, it's probably not going to work out very well, right? I think it's just uh -huh. a problem. It's and like, not only would that not work out, but it seems like it would be untrue because it seems like it's perfectly within our power to choose the opposite decision, whatever that de decision we're making is. Yeah. There's this experience of strengthening um, goals that we believe we ought to have, you know, um, and trying to weaken goals that we, that we have gotten to, to pursue. Um, that, that's another thing we've been studying is is self regulation, mm -hmm. and you know, how do you how do you do that, right? I had a salad for lunch today instead of a you know greasy turkey sandwich or whatever. You know, uh -huh. part of that might have been you know a lot of things, but but you know, enhancing the um, the perceived uh, benefits of, of the salad, you know, and thinking about who does that make me, how does that reflect on who who I am as a person, who I want to be, or something like that, right? And you know, am I a healthy person? Do I want to make healthy choices? Um, and and choosing not to focus on that smoked Gouda flavor that's so, you know, delicious, right? But I but I feel like I can tip the balance yeah. one way or the other. So then you're I guess this would be a good place to bring in your your research on emotions because it seems like when there's when there's stuff that we're consciously aware of, we feel like we're in control of whatever our decisions are, but then emotions sort of come out of the unconscious. I don't know if that's, that's probably not right technically, but that's sort, certainly how it feels. It's sort, it feels like they can kind of just come out of nowhere and then start warping um, the way we, we think about things. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Um, you know, yeah, and, and I do think just to, just to connect this to the, the previous conversation that self-regulation can really work we can study its neural effects. It doesn't always work. Sometimes it's superficial. You know, we can't talk ourselves into or out of being being scared, you know, for example, but sometimes we really can have a big impact. And so when, when we can do that, that's, that's an important thing. And emotions are two things. They are, they are target things that we try to regulate. You know, um, you know, if my child does something, you know, they, I don't know. Oh, one one time, one spilled orange juice on my laptop on a flight. That was bad, you know. So I'm like, okay, don't be angry about that. How do I do that? I enhance certain thoughts, right? To say, um, okay, they didn't mean to do that. That was an accident. 
you, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I can enhance those thoughts. So it's a it's a target thing to be regulated. You know, don't be angry about that um, or whatever. Um, and there are also things that what you're getting at is that can can potentially hijack those cognitive resources, right? And I think that's true as well. So if I'm really angry, I can, um, I can, I don't, I, I want to be angry. You know, I don't choose thoughts that will minimize it. I choose thoughts that feed the anger sometimes. You know, my whole perspective changes. And I think that that's real um, as well. But I'm not sure that they come out of the blue, right? I'm not sure that they come out just, just completely, at, you know, from some point that's be below the level of our, or beyond the level of our understanding, you know. So I, I kind of believe more in the view that um, that there are some very predictable kinds of appraisals that we make, you know, which is a cognitive conceptualizations of the world that will lead us to be angry or lead us to be afraid uh, and so forth. Yeah, yeah, they could definitely be predicted. I guess, I guess to clarify what I was getting at there, it's it's sort of more like the emotion might come up for one reason or another but then once it comes up it seems like it sort of puts on this this filter lens of like the way you perceive the world so like you could be looking at the same set of facts but if you're feeling depressed you might say you know it you all of your thoughts just might be like everything sucks why is this happening versus you could look at the same if you're feeling happy and feeling optimistic you could you could have a more positive interpretation of like the same set of facts I agree with you, Adam. I think that's a really powerful effect. Actually, I was talking with some people in the lab the other day about um, depression and how there really might, so, okay. So one of the major treatments for depression is CBT, which is belief focused. It's changing mm -hmm. your beliefs about you know, yourself and the future. So if I think, ah, I'm unlovable, nobody will ever love me. Well, is that a realistic belief? I don't, it can't be because it's about some abstract future. Like, how do you know that nobody will ever love you? Like, nobody can follow that, <laughs> you know? So it's yeah. an unrealistic belief, right? And so in CBT, you would challenge that, that belief. You challenge the basis for that belief, right? And of course, that idea, this concept that, um, and this is a cognitive concept, that um, the cause of my experiences of rejection are because I am unlovable. Um, that's that's a, a core causal belief that can lead to depression and other problems, right? In a powerful mm -hmm. way. But it is just a belief, right? It's an attribution to this this entity that you call your yourself and what in a stable in a stable way. And mm -hmm. all those things are what you those are not that's not reality. That's a construction, right? And so I think part of real cognitive change, which will then change our emotions and change our mood states and so on, is to, is to shift those core beliefs in, you know, what are the causes of our experience? Um, and, you know, is there, is there a, a stable sense of self that you connect um, these negative things to in particular, right? Or, or can you deconstruct that and realize that that's not you know, that's not how it works. That, that isn't true. Right. The interesting thing about that is it seems like the natural process is a sort of, it's like emotion upwards where you might start feeling a certain way and then your thoughts sort of start to match the, the, the feeling. So whether that's like these, no one will ever love me thoughts or like, you know, this is the best day ever thoughts. But then what's interesting is you're suggesting that it can also go in the opposite direction where the thoughts can move backwards and, and hopefully change the emotion. Yeah. And I actually think I think that, I don't know if this is all the time, but maybe most of the time, it's those thoughts that drive our feelings. And we just may not always recognize what those thoughts are or acknowledge those thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes they, we might not be aware of them because we don't want to acknowledge them or we don't, or we don't realize that they're just, they're just thoughts or beliefs that are up for grabs, you, you know? Um, so if you have a lot of experiences, okay, so I think, I believe I'm a smart guy, right? So, because I've had a lot of people, you know, when I was a kid, tell me I'm smart and so forth. So this is a belief I have about myself, right? But it's just a, it's just a belief. There is no, you know, smart is as smart does, right? Um, and so there's no guarantee that I'm, 
intelligent or stupid or whatever in any given situation. Uh, and so, but, but so what I'm trying to say is part, part of the sort of cognitive change might be, you know, realizing that, oh, that idea that I have a self who just is endowed with intelligence or not, that's a wrong belief. I don't have to buy into that system at all. You know, I can step outside of that. Do you think that's a newer ability? Like if, if we're speaking on evolutionarily, for example, it seems like you would have feelings before you have thoughts. And then even if you have thoughts, like simple thoughts, it would require even more uh, brain power in order to reflect on those thoughts and say, is this serving me well or is it not? Yeah. I do think that there are things that are that are new. So metacognitive awareness, which is the ability to sort of reflect on your own belief structures in, in, mm -hmm. in real time. I do think that that's, that's new. Um, but I also, I actually have a little different view because I, I think that the, um, the, the core, I'll say brain processes that give rise to the, the beliefs, the thoughts and the feelings that come from the thoughts really aren't so separable. That they are that they are connected, and that other species feel. You know, I think that they, they have their own versions of these things. And I don't know what they're uh -huh. like exactly. You know, but um, but yeah, that what we you know the 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 they're in they're enmeshed, right? The a, a, like a, a belief that um, a belief that I am in danger and about to be harmed. Like if somebody broke into my door with a, a gun or something right now, right? Mm -hmm. And the feelings that go with it and the reprioritization and the shaping of my thoughts and feelings and memories that go with it, they're, they're all really connected, you know? And so they probably sort of drive each other. Yeah. Um, and you can probably intervene. And I'm sort of focusing on intervening in the, in the, in the belief, right? And, but you can also intervene on the feeling end and you can either wind that, the fear up or you can wind it back down. <laughs> mm -hmm. So how, what, what would be um, an intervention example for winding it down? Because it's, it's, it's much easier to think of the ones that wind it up. Like, for example, you stub your toe and then you're suddenly just much more negative about everything for the next 10 minutes. Uh, but, but then winding it down, you can tell yourself, you know, it's just pain. It's just like these brain signals. My toe, I'm going to be fine. Everything's fine. But you're still going to be feeling the pain and it's still going to make you more negative. Yeah, I mean, let, let's let's go with your example, right? Um, so, you know, the idea that what creates the pain in the first place is this um, belief in tissue damage, right? Or this this um, you know something happens to your toe and you think there's this is this is going to damage your um, your 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 tissues, and this is why we evolved a pain system in the first place. Right, is to make that connection. And it's very automatic and you probably can't, well, arguably you can't sit there and turn it off. Um, although maybe some people can and sometimes you can. Um, and it goes along with the appraisal uh, uh, that, that of damage and then the feeling of, of pain. So if you, if you block the feeling of pain, let's say you, you know, put an anesthetic on your toe, right? And all of a sudden you don't feel the pain, but you still have the belief in, in damage. That can certainly help you unwind it, although you still might be afraid, right? And the, uh -huh. and the pain might still, you know, come back as soon as the drug wears off. But you could also um, unwind it from the belief side, right? So you could either really amplify that belief by saying, oh my God, my toe, is it, it's going to be long-term. I'm a gymnast and this is going to impact my ability to, to, to function, you know, going forward or whatever and focus on the toe and, you know, pay attention to all signals coming from the toe and start avoiding, you know, those, anything that produces those signals. And all of a sudden you're winding up, right? And you, you can develop chronic pain, who knows? Uh -huh. um, or you can wind it down by, you know, reinforcing the thoughts that this is temporary. It doesn't mean my toe is going to be injured long-term. Mm -hmm. So that, that yeah. still and, sounds like it's, it's like body first and feeling first. And then only the thoughts and the controlling it or influencing it one way or the other comes after. So what, what would an example be of something that's like thoughts first, feeling after? Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting point um, that there's, there's a primary process with the toe that's sort of very 
strongly and automatically activated in that case. Mm -hmm. But um, even with chronic pain, I think with emotions, you can be thoughts first. Uh, and I think that um, with chronic pain, you can also be thoughts first. And let me talk about emotion for a second and then come back to pain maybe, because with, with emotion, uh, one idea is that, you know, there is no, there's nothing like the toe, right? That's, that's driving a, an emotional response to a situation. There really is only the appraisal of that situation. What does that mean? And that means, yeah, that, um, that it, is, it is how we conceptualize the situation that causes the emotion in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, here's an example. Um, you're having dinner with a date and you know she keeps looking behind you mm -hmm. right um and you're talking and telling your story about about the brain you know and she's looking <laughs> over there and all of a sudden you're like okay so now how do you how, you know how, you can imagine a situation unfolding here right based on those subtle cues of, of eye gaze and stuff and you know what's going to create this emotion uh you know you look back and she's looking at this handsome guy in the tuxedo sitting behind you and you're like oh my god she's like you know so you could become uh -huh. jealous right um you could you could become angry um or you could not nothing right or you might think that she's distracted because you know something happened with her her sisters in the hospital and you're like wow i just really feel you're you know you, i really you can interpret this as uh anxiety right about mm -hmm. that something else and you can become really compassionate uh -huh. and nothing in that situation that tells that's driving anger, right? Or that's driving jealousy or whatever. It is the interpretation that is the root cause of that emotional response. It uh -huh. determines its form and intensity. So do you think the interpretation is like the sum of a bunch of little unconscious processes and then maybe they reach a threshold and you realize you're feeling anxious? Because it, it doesn't seem like it's in your control, even if it's based on the appraisal. And even if you, you decide to change your mind and think, no, these thoughts are ridiculous. The thoughts still come from somewhere. And it, and it's usually, if it's like a negative thought coming out of somewhere, you probably didn't summon it yourself. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think we're, we're these are inferences. It, it, we're, so in some of the newer work we're doing, we're really trying to think about of systems of belief. You know, mm -hmm. um, if we take this example, it's even the proposition that, uh, you know, I'm on a date, that's a belief. You know, essentially, uh -huh. and, you know, here's a, here's a woman sitting across from me and she's looking behind me. That's also a belief. It's an inference. Right. And so mm -hmm. forth. So there's this whole system of, of inferences and we're not in control. We don't, you know, yeah, we're not in control of what those inferences are because many of them are, um, they are constrained by the environment. They've become, you know, embedded in our, the way our brains process information. So for example, I can't right now honestly um, believe that I'm underwater, right? I just can't do it. I can imagine I'm underwater and mm -hmm. it, it will be some changes that, that in my brain that are sort of like underwater-like. Right. But I, you know, the inference that I'm here on dry land is so strong, you know, that I, that I, can't, I can't honestly change it. Yeah, and it seems like if you were truly underwater, like dangerous level underwater, there would probably be some like instinctive fear stuff that that kicks in. But that that, that doesn't even happen, even if you would try and imagine it as realistically as you can. It's like there's something in the background that says, I, this is so fake that your body's not even going to bother with the stress response. Yeah, I would be hallucinating, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> and maybe I really would panic. Right? That would be amazing. Maybe if people are hypnotized, you know, they can have these stronger responses. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, which I think is, is possible, you know, that you can, yeah, become, you can enter into a state where you're more uh, influenceable or suggestible in that way. Uh -huh. But yeah, so I guess my point is by, by and large, you know, we, our emotions come from these appraisals, how, what we, what we believe about the situation and what we infer um, and what we think the causes are mm -hmm. um, of what's happening. And those drive our emotions. And we can, when we are trying to self-regulate, we, we can work with those causes, right? If I'm feeling pain, mm -hmm. I can say, well, I know this is gonna be over soon. 
So that's a that's a particular belief about the qualities of this painful thing on my toe, right? That mm -hmm. um, I can work, I can try to amplify that and work with it. And um, I might, you know, if I really believe in my heart of hearts that that's true, it might have a strong effect. If mm -hmm. I don't, if I can't, right, can't really accept that, then it may not, it may not work very well at all. Uh -huh. So the appraisal is central, but you not, might not necessarily always be consciously in control of whatever appraisal is going on. That's right. I think often we don't really know what the appraisals are, even that we're making. Yeah. <laughs> necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. And and often we may not be aware that there are alternative uh, appraisals too. Mm -hmm. So how do you study this stuff in your lab? Um, in various ways, um, you know, so gosh, um, one, one thing we've done is we've, we've tried to, um, we try to create an experience. It could be pain. It could be looking at the person who rejected you in love. It could be looking at somebody else in pain and more things, hearing aversive sounds or whatever. And we, what we want to do is understand, okay, what are, what's the basic skeleton of what, what creates that process? And we want to be able to track it in the brain. I want to be able to track it physiologically. Uh, you know, does it make you sweat? Um, and that's a target. So let's say it's about looking at um, the person who uh, rejected you in love. So this is based on a paper we published a few years ago. Uh -huh. um, We'd like to know, okay, what's the brain circuit that identifies that? Um, and is it, you know, maybe unique to that and, and not other kinds of experiences or what, what's really tracking the feeling? Um, what's, you know, does your body responding? Do, do, are you sweating? Is your blood pressure going up? And then that's a target. Those are targets for the intervention. And then we give you a, in this case, a placebo where you say, you know, snort this stuff up your nose, it's oxytocin, it's the love drug, and it's gonna make everything feel better. <laughs> you know, you're not gonna, um, <laughs> or an anxiolytic, whatever. But like, you know, this is this is really gonna, gonna take the edge off and you're, it's gonna, you know, um, help you see things from a distance perspective and not respond, you know, to, to, to this. Uh, you know, it's gonna blunt the negative emotions. And then, you know, we do it. So we're trying to manipulate your beliefs. Um, in a coarse way, right, uh, in this case. And then we see what happens with those target processes. Does the brain change and does the physiology change? Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at something more nuanced like jealousy, is the theory that, like I could imagine two competing hypotheses. One would be something like every unique emotion you could experience is uniquely represented in the brain. And the other might be something like you have a set of primary emotions and everything else is just like primary emotion plus context. Yeah, I, I think in, in terms of right. So, so this question is really about what those what those targets ought to be, and mm -hmm. do they follow basic emotion categories? Like, right. is there an anger response in the brain or a disgust response in the brain that you could then push up and down? You know, mm -hmm. um, or is it something else? And I think that in many ways the, the jury is still out, but I think what the field has shifted towards or what the field shifted away from is this idea that there are these hardwired systems that you just activate that correspond to those basic emotion categories like mm -hmm. anger or disgust um i believe that they're all constructed um and so there's a certain set of appraisals that you would make uh, that lead to anger so for example if you perceive yourself as being harmed and if you perceive that harm to be intentional and you perceive your resources to be greater, essentially to, 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 to you know, squash the, heart, the, the source of that harm uh, rather than, you know, being overpowered by, by the source of harm, then you're going to get angry. And that set of appraisals together is, is anger, but that there are many varieties of anger. And we don't really know how, um, how you know, if, whether we can tell anger in the brain apart from, you know, apart from disgust or sadness very well. Right. So if, if you couldn't tell, then it would be, I guess the baseline thing would just be maybe approach or avoidance. And then it would be, is anger just avoidance plus, you know, an angry situation or, or disgust avoidance plus something that's disgusting to you or. Right. And, and I don't, yes. And I also don't. So, so I think I said the jury's really out and this is a mm -hmm. deep question about how, what emotions are. 
Um, but I, I, I don't also, I don't think that there's a system for anger that just gets activated. I also don't think that there's a system for negative valence um, necessarily in general that, you know, then you just add something to some color to, and that becomes anger. You know, uh -huh. I, I think of it as really a pattern of, um, yeah, a, a pattern of essentially perceived causes, these appraisals, like per perceived causes and perceived future impacts that if it's the right configuration, then we generate anger. But when, what we call anger in one situation, you know, what's, what's annoying or something like that, right? You know, like somebody wants to like argue over a bill or something like that versus other kinds of, of anger, right? Like, you know, you punch me in the eye and then I get really angry, you know, that's a different, um, that, that might be something quite different in the brain. And we don't know, really know what all the sort of, you know, flavors are, how to capture them, you know? Yeah. That's, we've been working on that, um, you know, and, and the brain does respond differently to different emotion categories. Um, but I also don't think it's quite so simple as, you, you know, as, as we've thought, right? Mm -hmm. So we still have to sort of figure out what those, what the targets are exactly. Right. So I'm not familiar with research on most other emotions, but I have heard some some arguments that fear is innate and that uh, that fear associations can be learned quick more quickly than than like other non fear associations. Yeah, I I think that we're one way of saying sort of rephrasing what you said and reflecting it back is is that um, some we are we are predisposed to associate some stimuli in the world with threat. Uh -huh. So it's easier to get, um, you know, uh, a conditioned response to pictures of spiders, right? Paired with shocks, let's say. Mm -hmm. And it is pictures of bunny rabbits paired with shocks or neutral objects, you know, to take it back to our, our neutral uh, right. Your question, right? Paired with shocks. So we are, we are predisposed, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we, and we may well be predisposed to, to, um, to err on the side of perceiving things as threatening, you, you know, um, than safe uh -huh. overall, because the costs of, of threat, you know, the cost of missing something threatening are, are greater. So that sounds kind of like innate emotions, but what's the nuance I'm missing there? Well, I think it's separating the, um, the emotion from the the causes you know in, in this case or from from the stimuli that we're prepared to give you know to, to, to link with emotions so I would say this so, so I would define an emotion um, like fear uh, as having these uh, more complicated elements to it right it's there's an experience there's thoughts about the future right uh, um, if you don't anticipate negative consequences in the future, you know, it might be hard to, to say it's, it's fear, right? Uh -huh. uh, versus in the studies that are often called fear, like fear conditioning, where you have a spider picture and you have a, a shock, right? Um, it's not clear that that's the same thing as, you know, fear of uh, being alone or fear of losing my savings in the stock market or whatever, right? Fear for my children or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So in a way, I would call this basic situation, you know, where um, the amygdala is involved in representing a stimulus, which is then linked with a shock and forms this basic memory that, oh, here comes a shock, you know, as a basic affective threat learning process. Mm -hmm. But but it does, it, but there seems to be many kinds of fear that go beyond that, that basic affective response. Mm -hmm. So do you think that means that all emotions are like essentially predictive because to experience an emotion just right here and now, and then imagining that it has no relevance whatsoever to even like a second from now, it doesn't seem to make much sense. It seems like necessarily it has to be related to not only you now, but your immediate future. Yeah, I, I think that um, emotions are exist because they encapsulate predictions about what, um, not only what's gonna happen to us in a given situation, right? Or what might happen, but also what the right response is to that. Mm -hmm. um, 
And this goes, so, and this kind of links in with this stuff we talked about placebo effects and, um, and you know, conceptions influencing how we perceive pain and so forth. And this fits in because there's this broader idea that what the brain is always doing is it's contracting this internal model uh, of, of what are the causes of what's happening to me? What situations am I in now? And what's gonna happen to me as a result? And not just what's gonna happen, but then what action should I take to minimize the bad things and maximize the good things happening? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so I, I do think that's the reason why we have emotions. Like, think about about uh, an anger. So, so you know, uh, uh, somebody punches you, you know, punches you in the eye, right? That really hurts. And then you go, you know, you are you going to get angry? Or are you going to get scared? Right. Well, it depends. Mm -hmm. If it's if it's a little kid, right? If it's like a three year old, you might be annoyed. You might be like, oh, stop that, you know? Or you might, you know, um, if you know, if it's uh, if it's a big, strong, scary supervillain, you know, you, you, uh, <laughs> you might be, you know, you might, you might curl up into a little ball, right? And so, uh -huh. but, it, but there is this, right, this implicit calculation of what's the, what's the right response given this whole situation and who am I up against and what are the whole parameters in the context of that? Um, what's, what's the right response? And that's, that's what we call emotion. Uh -huh. And that's also related to the appraisal thing we talked about. That's right. And that's why I believe that appraisals are primary in driving emotions, you know, mm -hmm. or at least, yeah, um, our, our, our conception of ourself in the context is, mm -hmm. is critical for determining which emotion and, and how intense that is. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. I think that's a good place to stop. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank and, you so much for your time, Tor. All these things. That's why we can influence them with placebo effects and influence them with self-regulation too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, great. Right. It's been nice to chat. You yeah. too. Thank you. All right.